This is the state of the nation. Ibifa Mwanga. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Sal. All right, all right. Welcome to the African Alumni Association. This is the State of the Nation. My name is Henry Sully. Before we start, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto African Alumni Association operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land for the Huron Wendant, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across the Tato Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity uh, to work on this land. Again, welcome to the African Alumni Association. My name is Henry Sully, and this is the state of the nation. Before we start, uh, there's something new that I would like us to test out, something that is going to be beneficial uh, to you and everyone out there, I hope. Uh, it's an education section that we are adding to these conversations. The education is still me. I thought about something new, something that I hope will benefit you, your family, and your friends. It is something that is going to try to educate a little bit, specifically as it regards to the constitution of Uganda. So, as we start, the constitution of Uganda has a lot to offer. And we learn a lot uh, from the constitution as it pertains to the duties of a citizen, but also uh, the duties of the legislators, the police, and the lawmakers in general. The Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, 1995, provides for derogable and non derogable rights. Non derogable rights are inherent rights which cannot be deprived of an individual. These are found under Article 44 of the Constitution, and they include freedom of torture and cruel inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment, freedom from slavery and servitude, a fight their fear, a right and order of habeas corpus. Per our topic today, which is about torture, there are certain questions we need to interrogate as it pertains to the violation of human rights. For example, a victim's rights to personal liberty are violated by, 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 by the security agencies. Article 23 of the Constitution provides that no person shall be subjected to arbitrary, be arbitrarily arrest and detention without reasonable cause. Article 23, Section 3 requires that a person arrested, restricted, or detained shall be informed of the reasons for their, for their arrest or detention. Article 23, Section 2 pro prohibits detention of a, of a person arrested and unauthorized. Article 23, Section 2 prohibits detention of a person arrested in an unauthorized and ungazetted detention center. Article 23, Section 4b requires that a person detained and restricted on suspicion of having committed an offense must be taken to court not later than 48 hours. And the same article, sec, uh, and the same article 23, section 5A requires 
that a person upon arrest, a person shall be allowed to inform his next of kin about the arrest. That may include counsel. In the case of Gregory Kafuzi versus Attorney General, 2000, Carl 743, court held that Article 235A requires that an, arrest, an arrested person shall be allowed to inform his family that he has been arrested, failing which is a violation of his or her constitutional right. The denial of this right by the security agencies invaluably violated their right in that regard. Often a time you find security agencies or agents, police asking bribes from victims' families in exchange for their freedom. Hence the family members selling of properties and borrowing money, getting into debt for the freedom of their loved one. Certainly, without a doubt, extortion of money from the victim families, from the victims' families in exchange for their freedom is not only criminal, bordering on impunity, but also a violation of the victim's constitutional right to own property. It is noted that the right to personal liberty is not absolute. And we know that. And the right under Article 23 is not one of non-derogable rights. Under certain justifications provided for, provided for under section under Article 20, under Article 43, Section 1 of the Constitution, the rights to liberty can be restricted. We understand that. However, in certain cases, the oppressors do not plead any justification. This leads to court to ruling that without justification, the arrest and detention was arbitrarily and abuse of power of police, which is enjoined in Article 21.2, which is to preserve law and order, and under Article 20, Section 1, to protect rule of law, good governance, and human rights. The only logical inference is that the victim's right to freedom, of, to freedom from torture as guaranteed under Article 24 and, and Article 44, 44A of the Constitution are infringed, are infringed on by the law enforcement agents. Court of law emphasized that presentation of personal liberty is a very crucial aspect of the Constitution and derogation from it has to be a matter of only unavoidable necessity. And the constitution ensures that such derogation is temporary and not indefinite. Further, the constitution has mechanisms where the enjoyment of the right that has been temporarily interrupted can be reclaimed through the right to the order of habeas corpus, which is inavailable and cannot be suspended. This position was reaffirmed in the case of Honorable Sam Kutesa and two others versus Attorney General Constitutional Reference Number 54 of 2001, 2011. I beg your pardon, 2011. We all know that Dr. Stella Nyanzi and Kakwenza Aluklabashaija were arrested and detained in ungazetted detention centers. For Dr. Stella, she was abducted, thrown into a numberless car and taken to an unknown place without give, having been given an opportunity to inform her family members or a lawyer. 
in the case of Mr. Kakwenza, his house was broken into, he was abducted, refused a right to connect or inform his counsel and taken to an unknown place. The second question that is important for us to interrogate is whether the victim's freedom from torture was violated by the security agencies. Section two of the Prevention and Prohibition of Torture Act defines torture to mean any act or omission by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person by whether a public by whether a public official or other person acting in an official or private capacity for such purposes as obtaining information or confession from the person or any other person, punishing that person for an act, he or she or any other person has committed or in suspect to have or is being suspected to have committed or planning to commit or intimidating or coercing, forcing that person or any other person to do or retain from doing any act. Further to that section, further to that point, section three of the Prevention of Torture Act 2012 provides that for prohibition of torture and the enjoyment of the right to freedom from torture shall be non-derogable. Article 20, 24 of the Constitution guarantees freedom from torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. This guarantee is absolute and in fact prohibitory as per Article 44A of the Constitution. Article 44 of the Constitution provides that not to withstanding anything in this Constitution, there shall be no derogation from enjoyments of the following rights and freedoms. A, the freedom from torture and cruel inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. Therefore, freedom from torture is a non-derogable right under the Constitution. This is important. We need to know this. We need to educate us. We need to educate you. We need to educate the community. So that, you know where to refer. What are the references that are going to make me free as a person? Therefore, for an act to amount to torture, not only must there be certain severity in pain and suffering, but the treatment must also be intentionally inflicted for a prohibited purpose. Evidence of the victim has to show that all the ingredients of torture were available during the unlawful arrest and illegal detention. Legally, in arriving to a decision, whether certain treatment amounts to torture, the court takes into account factors of each individual case, such as the duration of the treatment, its physical and mental effects, age, sex, health, and vulnerability of the victim. Courts apply a very strict test when considering whether there was there has been a breach of an individual's right of freedom from torture or inhumane degrading treatment. There are no exceptional circumstances to justify torture. Besides, holding an individual without permitting him or her to have contact with his or her family and refusing to inform the family if if and where the individual is being held is inhumane treatment of both the detainee and the family of the concerned. 
So we need to ask ourselves another important question. Wakakwenza's family and friends tortured in the process of not telling them where they had taken him. How about Stella's family and friends? In the persuasive case of Ireland versus United Kingdom, ECHR application number 5310 of 2017, court explained the distinction between torture and inhumane and degrading treatment. And degrading treatment lies in the difference in intensity of suffering inflicted. Also to underscore is the fact that freedom from torture is one of the most universally recognized human rights. And the ban on torture is found in a number of international treaties to which Uganda is a signatory or party. Another question that we need to interrogate, very important question, is whether victims are entitled to any remedies. Article 50, Section 1 of the Constitution entitles a person who claims that his fundamental rights and freedoms have been violated to file an action in the competent court, which may award redress to the applicant which may include compensation. To note, redress is wider than compensation. Redress includes punitive damages, which are meant to punish the violator for violation of the constitution. So ask yourself something. Will Kakwenza's tormentors be punished? Will Dr. Stella Nyanzi's tormentors be punished? These are questions we are going to interrogate here. Article 23, Section 7 provides that any person unlawfully arrested, restricted, or detained by any other person or authority shall be entitled to compensation from that other person or authority, whether it is the state or an agency of the state or other person or authority. In the case of Uganda Commercial Bank versus Chigozi, 2002, AEA 305, it was held that a plaintiff who suffers damage due to the wrongful act of the defender, defendant must be put in the position he or she would have been, would have been in had she or he not suffered wrong. In the persuasive case, of Jennifer Muthoni and 10 others versus Attorney General of Kenya 2012 EKLR, a case for enforcement of rights and freedoms. Court held that the purpose of awarding damages in constitutional matters should not be limited to simple compensation. Such an award out, out in proper cases be made with a view to deterring the repetition of breach or breach or punishment. These, those responsible for any securing effective policing of the constitutional enshrined rights by rewarding those who expose breach of them with substantial damages. But we use Uganda. Why do these cases of torture continually get replicated by the security forces? What's the work of the judiciary? What does it have to do to ensure that these cases do not become repetitive? in our society. In the case of Daylon Johnson Wilson and others, Attorney General HCCS 0027 of 2010, court held 
that punitive punitive damages can be awarded where there has been oppressive, arbitrarily, or unconstitutional action by the servants of government. Section 27.1 of the Civil Procedure Act provides that costs shall follow the event unless court shall, for good reason, otherwise order. You realize how much power the court is being given without wasting any more of your time. Let me invite the guests for today to engage in this conversation as we interrogate some of these rhetorical, more conceptual uh, questions. In the studio today, we have Dr. Stella Nyanzi and Kakwenza Rukilabasaija. They are going to tell us about their stories, but also engage in some of the bigger questions that I have posed. And without any other, uh, any further ado, Professor Dr. Stella Nyanz, welcome to the State of the Nation. Right, thank you very much, Henry. Um, I have to keep my mask on because I'm at the airport. I'm in between cities and uh, it's wonderful to be on your platform. I did not like waiting for 30 minutes as you spoke alone. It's quite masturbatory, but um, I'm delighted to be with Kakwenza and Kirabasraija on the same show. And I have to apologize to the audience because I will be leaving uh, slightly earlier than usual, although it's wonderful to give the rest of the evening to Kakwenza and Kirabasraija. Kakwenza, we salute you. Welcome to Germany. It's uh, wonderful to be with you. I love you very much, my son. And I will bring some healing oil to your library when I come back to Munich. Thank you so much, Dr. Stella. Mr. Kakwenza, welcome to the State of the Nation. How do you feel? And uh, tell us about yourself. Thank you, my brother, Henry. And nice to uh, be on your show. Thank you so much, my mother, uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi. Thank you for um, everything. I love you too. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm feeling fine. I'm out of the jurisdiction of the crocodile, so I am very fine. I just want to assure you uh, that at the state of the nation, you are free to say whatever truth you have to bring out. Uh, and uh, no one is going to stop you at that. Uh, so since uh, Dr. Stella will be leaving us shortly, I'm just going to give her the first opportunity to tell us about her experience uh, and relate to some of the, the, the issues that I've, uh, I have outlined uh, in that introductory remarks uh, that includes so many bigger questions, of course. Uh, right, so shall I go ahead, Henry? Thank you very yes. much. I think yeah. for me that it's wonderful you are teaching people the law. And I think that uh, those wonderful articles you are quoting for us assume that Uganda is a state that abides by the law. Clearly, we are a lawless society. And so it is one thing to arm citizens with education about the law and teach them about their human rights in a democratic society where human rights are upheld and uh, respected by those who are supposed to implement and enforce the law, this would be wonderful. However, under Yoweri Museveni's dictatorship, we all know that it is a lawless country under which we live. The police do not care if one quotes for them the right to uh, be read their charges at the time of arrest. Almost every time I have been arrested, and I've been arrested over 20 times in the last five years in Uganda, nobody has read to me my charges, even when I have insisted in the presence of other protesters or individually or in the presence of my lawyers to be told what my charges are. None of the arresting officers have done that. In fact, there are times I have been detained for a day, two days, three days, and my charge sheet is not uh, given to me. My charges are not read to me. The most scandalous is when I was arrested under the pretext of soliciting money from the public without uh, permission from the inspector general of police for sanitary pads. 
and we all assumed that the charges against me were related to public soliciting. And when after a number of uh, days without uh, being produced before a, a, a magistrate in court, the charge sheet changed. And instead of public soliciting, which is the charges that had been given to my lawyers outside um, the, the court, in fact, I was read with charges of offensive communication. Okay, so the charge sheet changed. What my lawyers prepared for was different to what the courts read to us. And so the idea that a prisoner, a suspect, an arrested person, a detainee, will be respected as a person who has laws that protect them in the hands of their arrested or arresters or detainers is not uh, consistent with the practice in Uganda. So practice by the police highlights, this is another point I want to raise, that the police in Uganda, it doesn't matter how much money by foreign donors is spent on education about human rights and the law. It is the police and security agencies such as the SFC and uh, the CMI and Flying Squad and whoever else are arresting people and breaking the human rights laws that they have been taught <laughs> using expensive donor funds. We know that there are programs such as JLOS, which are heavily funded by the Dutch, by the Germans, by European Union, by the US, by Canada, by UK, to educate uh, and law enforcement officers, security agencies about the human rights of suspects and detained persons. And I don't know why that money is wasted. If anything, I should uh, recommend it is retracted from the government of Uganda and rechanneled to civil society organizations who will do a better job of teaching, but also that this money should perhaps go to teaching suspects and the public our rights. I wanted to touch a bit on the issue of habeas corpus. Again, a very good law. <laughs> but we have seen even judges and magistrates, judicial officers who should take the habeas corpus provision seriously that if a person has been disappeared for over 48 hours and a lawyer makes an application for their presentation to court, um, that many times, sometimes judicial officials have refused to, 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 to give the writ of habeas uh, corpus audience. And so a lawyer wants to make this application but the judicial officer disappears. And so for a week, there is hide and seek. Meanwhile, the whereabouts of a detained person remain unknown. We have also seen police officers who promise to produce uh, prisoners. In the case of Kakwenza, it happened. I think that's the most recent case where it happened, that the police promised to produce Kakwenza Rukila Bashaija in court. And uh, in spite of a habeas corpus uh, declaration, made by the magistrate's court, Kakwenza wasn't uh, produced. And so we see, for me, it, it highlights the collusion between the judicial officers and the, you know, the court system, the prison officers, the police even, to break these good laws in Uganda. And the last thing I want to talk about, perhaps from your introduction, is the idea around um, um, compensation and reparations and remedies. And I want to highlight, if you had told us early, I would have brought a copy of my, uh, a petition that was made to the United Nations Working Group Against Arbitrary Detention on my behalf in 2017, an application that was made by Chapter 4, together with Robert Kennedy Foundation for Human Rights and the UN Working Group uh, Against Arbitrary Detention made a judgment Part of the, this is 2017, part of the requirements was that the government of Uganda would respond to their decision that uh, my rights to, you know, all these rights you've been reading to us, my constitutional rights were violated in many instances, and um, that part of the remedies they required was compensation or any other reparations given to me, investigation into the violation um, of, of, of any rights and, and, and outcome that the government should investigate why a flying squad, because after our own private investigations, we confirmed it was members of the f flying squad under the directives of Kale Kaihura, who abducted me, who picked me off the streets, who drove me around the city and dumped me in an unknown detention facility, who told my family they didn't have me. And Kale Kaihura went on 
on, on, on national TV and denied that the police had me. And then later on, it was discovered that I'd actually been eventually dumped at the SIU in Chirepa, the Special Investigations Unit, and then later dumped at Chira Division Police Station. But um, none of the investigations that the UN Working Group asked for have, was done. No compensation was given. No reparations were given. No legislative amendment. The third uh, requirement is that the police, the security, the judiciary, and the parliament create an amendment, a change in the law to ensure that the human rights uh, constitutional provisions of reading for us are entirely and in tandem with practice in Uganda. I will shock you, Henry. I think I've mentioned it before, but it is now 2022. The government of Uganda has never responded to the UN's decision. The government of Uganda has never given me any compensation or other reparations. The government of Uganda has never done an investigation. The government of Uganda has never had any legislative amendment. In fact, what we see is continuing, uh, in fact, an escalation of abductions of Ugandans off the yeah. streets. We see an increase in illegal detentions in unknown facilities, a creation of many more unknown facilities. We see an escalation of tortured, suspe tortured suspects and prisoners being released. And we are so traumatized <laughs> because there are no laws to protect us from torture. We are so traumatized that many would rather keep quiet or flee or go to exile because the government is not responding to the relevant uh, legal and, and legislative amendments that could happen from this. But I will stop here because I realize that um, um, Kakwenza must have a lot to say with regards to the very same. All right, Mr. Kakwenza, your turn, sir. You are muted. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mr. Sali. And thank you so much, Dr. Nyanzi, for highlighting the most pregnant issues. As also raised by uh, Mr. Sali, I, I think you have explained to Ugandans exactly what they should be knowing right now. The problem is that Mr. Museven has taken advantage of the ignorance uh, you know, there is that indescribable ign ignorance Ugandans are uh, encapsulated in in regards to not knowing the law properly. You find someone uh, in the villages lying to people on radio that, yeah, Mr. Kakwenza abused the president, so he must be tortured. You know, the way they justify torture in total disregard of the law, it really... It is really very sad. That is the effect of uh, being ignorant. You find some old person of 50, 70 years justifying torture, blaming you, victimizing you after being brutally tortured, and uh, also adding salt to the injury that, yeah, you abused the president, so you should be tortured. It is also like right now uh, the, the, the Russian the invasion of Ukraine, how people are ignoring the human rights issue, how uh, Russia is killing the innocent people in Ukraine, and they are justifying it, uh, uh, thinking that it is, it is against the West's hypocrisy. It is very bad. People should be uh, taught that, people should be taught about the law. People should be, enlightened that even getting a person and slapping them is torture. Even uh, detaining a person for more than 48 hours is torture, is against uh, human rights uh, laws. Then you find a magistrate, a whole magistrate who has a PhD in laws conniving with a state and he begins to uh, preside over illegalities, like in my case. I was tortured, I was brought to his court when I was bleeding blood, when I was uh, all swollen, but he disregarded the laws about, uh, you know, human rights laws and sent me to prison instead of sending me to, uh, to the hospital. You know, the, uh, for example, Human Rights Act, the Anti-Torture Act, he was supposed to stay the proceedings and first handles the human rights issues I raised but he, in total disregard of the law, 
he behaved like so if I, if i call such a person very stupid is, is that an abuse or it is a description of who exactly he is you know all the right. process yes even my arrest was illegal my arrest was illegal my detention was illegal my prostitution it was pro not prostitution but political persecution so how do you really explain such things we live in a country where by our leaders do not follow the law there is no rule of law you know right. or as a as an ingredient to democracy or an ingredient ingredient of democracy instead maybe whatever they do they justify their I cannot call it a democracy, I call it a sevenocracy. Dr. Stella, what are your thoughts about uh, how the government has responded or in total disregard of the UN uh, expectation, completely refused to compensate you or even acknowledge uh, their wrongdoing in arresting you illegally? Right. I mean, what, what the government has done for me is not, is, is not unique or special. It is what they did with Kakwenza Rukiravashaija. Okay. Right. It is what they did with uh, Dr. Chizabesaji. It is what they did with all the victims of torture in Uganda. We haven't seen any precedents where a tortured person, tortured by the state, tortured by the military, tortured by uh, the police in Uganda, tortured by all these paramilitary pseudo uh units we haven't seen any compensation or response or remedies in fact what we have seen is yuri museveni playing a dodgy rhetorical game where he knows it's human rights day or he knows that uh foreign partners bilateral partners are watching and they've put a strict eye on him and he makes these rhetorical statements condemning the use of human of, of torture condemning the violation of human rights, and then we see him, in fact, celebrating violence and supporting it. And so, am I surprised when a dictatorial, militant, punitive, repressive government ignores the UN uh, working group against arbitrary detentions uh, decision and their recommendations? I'm not surprised. That is what dictators do. Okay, Yoram Seven is a dictator, he's a murderer, he's a torturer, he's brutal. I would be very surprised and shocked if anything was done in the reverse, if anything different was done. I think what is important is that we compile all this evidence. In the post Museveni time, these people will pay. The magistrates, the judges, the police officers, the military personnel, the paramilitary pseudo-security officers will be brought to book because the laws of Uganda protect us. That is the first thing I want to say. I, I think it's two points. One, that that's what dictators do. They won't respond. Two, that um, we must compile this evidence. If not for this particular season, in the post-Museveni era, we are going to take action. And so each of these individuals must know that they will be culpable, they will be brought to book, they will be made answerable. And I think for me, what is interesting is that Yuri Museveni might have presidential immunity right now. A number of these individuals who are obeying his orders without thought, without reason, and they're violating the laws of our country, do not have uh, presidential immunity. They don't have any amnesty. And I think one of the things we can do in terms of strategic litigation, since you are uh, interested in teaching people, one of the things I propose we can do in terms of activism with the law is to take on examples. For example, uh, the, 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 the magistrate who was responsible for mishandling Kakwenza Rukira case, I would sue him. I would challenge him not so much to win in court, but to have that political statement. And it would be public litigation for public interest to make a particular point. And so um, in response to the lack of action, I think as long as those of us who have been tortured don't respond, as long as we don't push back, as long as we don't resist, there will be more and more of this. And since today we're doing something around the law, 
I think that uh, the, an invitation, I'm issuing an invitation to lawyers and human rights lawyers and others interested in public strategic litigation to take on these torturers. We know their names. They don't have presidential immunity such as Yoweri Museveni does. We can sue them. We can go after them. And we might eventually lose the legal battle, but we shall have made a political statement of resistance and pushing back. And the next person who has to ignore the implications of torturing an individual in, in Uganda will remember, ah, but remember what happened to that individual judge, that individual government uh, personnel, that individual even security officer. We know the security, we know the police officers and the SFC people. And Muhozi, we know Muhozi, Kakweza has mentioned Muhozi was in that room. And so one of the things that we can do is to take Muhozi to military court. I don't think that Guti was created to only judge NUP and FDC and other opposition members. Guti can also bring Muhozi to court. We can invite him to court and maybe he can use the first family amnesty to ignore an invitation to military court to be tried for torturing a Ugandan civilian. <laughs> okay. But more and more creative ways of using the law can be used to bring these people to account, but also to push back and give resistance. Thank you so much for, for that submission, Dr. Stella. Uh, Mr. Kakwenza, what are your thoughts on that? You, you, uh, as, as Dr. Stella indicated, uh, you have mentioned in some of your previous comments that you seem to have uh, witnessed Muhoska and Ogawa in that room where you were being tortured. Uh, have you thought about taking him to court to, to meet a record? And do you think you should? Thank you so much. I do not agree with uh, Dr. Stelenias that we should wait for Mr. M7 to go and we handle these people. Of course, you know, Mr. M7 has a, a toolbox full of chamuchas. You know, now, like, for example, uh, Kandiho has been, okay, the, the sanctions took a toll on him and, you know, he has been again given another position and he has been repressed by another person. So right now we should, as Ugandans, we should lobby the Western governments. You know, there must be common values that bound the relationship between Mr. Museveni and them. On what basis does... USA government, European Union, the British government, on what basis do they, uh, what is the common values as to why they support, they keep on supporting Mr. M7 in total, I mean, uh, contrary to what they should be standing with him, you know? There should be some common values. I do not think that they should keep on supporting Mr. M7 even when, uh, the, the, the human rights record is uh, soiled. They are flagrant abusers of human rights. I do right. not think that they should keep cashing him, cashing him, giving him whatever he wants, whatever he asks, they give him and the relationship flourishes. So how are we Ugandans benefiting? They are the ones giving him feathers to torture, to torture us more. Now for now, this Mohozi, Mohozi personally tortured me. We have evidence. Uh, one of the affidavits we have, they submitted to court, says that he directed that I get arrested. He cannot deny that. Even I met him three times, two times in military detention, and uh, the last time when I was rearrested from Chitaria prison at the gate, I was taken to him. That was the last time I saw him. I understand him very well. That is the eyewitness. And I am going to handle him in whatever way possible. So he can, there is no way he can deny that he did not take part in my torture. Yes. So when they are giving sanctions, when they are sanctioning against uh, Uganda's military people, uh, the West should not only look at them, they should target even Mr. M7 himself and his stupid son. It doesn't make sense when they target this, uh, the Mukene and when they really know that they are replaceable. If they were targeting irreplaceable people would understand, but it doesn't make sense to target these small people and 
Yet, Mr. Museven has very many in his toolbox. They are replaced, but the following day they can be replaced. Right. Do Dr. Stella, uh, when you hear Mr. Kakwenza say that, first of all, he, he, he thinks that we should uh, take on the, 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 the president of Uganda right now, not, not after he leaves. Uh, but what do you think the international agencies or international partners should do to be kept accountable uh, in their dealings with the dictator not right now as you describe him? Right. So, Henry, I think I'm the only Ugandan who has uh, challenged Yoweri Museveni in court. The first time I was charged with uh, offensive communication and cyber harassment, I demanded that he comes to court. And that is the time that I learned for myself that Yoweri Museveni is a coward. He says he is offended, but he cannot stand on his legs. Two or three of them, his third small leg, has no power to send him as a man to court to charge a woman. He says he, he, he got offended by his, her talk. The second time that I challenged Joey Museveni to come to court, uh, again, I was charged with cyber harassment and offensive communication. In fact, this time we did not invite him to come and be a complainant. But um, I, I invited him to come and give witness and give evidence of, of, of what in my poem, because a poem I'd written offended, they, they, they claim allegedly that um, my poem had offended himself, his wife, his family, because I write about Esiteri and his mother is called Esiteri, but I am called Stella. My grandmother was called Esiteri. So which Esiteri am I writing about? Anyway, to, to go away from the literature lesson, I think that I am the first woman, the first Ugandan to stand in a court, a lower court and dare Yoweri Museveni, not once, twice, to come to the court, come and accuse me, come and give witness evidence. And on both occasions, he failed. A lot of people did not realize what we were doing with my legal team, that it was a strategy to show we can touch you. In South Africa, where uh, President N Nelson M Madiba Mandela also enjoyed presidential immunity, he came to court at least seven times. Okay, stood in the witness dock, stood even in the suspect's dock. Okay, and he was able to, to, to take a waiver, to wave away the presidential immunity and come to court in the defense of justice. Okay, and if you were he was any noble, well, if you were he had any honor in him, as the constitution says of the president, the executive must be a fountain of honor, but the fountain of honor in Uganda is dry. Yoweri Museveni has no balls. You know? And he was unable, he failed totally to come to court. Um, and so while in terms of strategic litigation, it is wonderful to take him on. Su Museveni, Su Mohozi, Su Kataha, Su all of them, Su SFC, as indeed Kakwanza Rukira Bashaita rightly says. And I think for me, it would be a political case as opposed to a legal battle, the legal battle might be lost, but the political case can be made. And of course, the magistrates often and the judicial officers are scared of touching the executive because he has compromised the, uh, the judiciary. Many of the judges and magistrates are cadres whom he has appointed. He rewards, he promotes based on what service they give to him. And so many of our judges are working in his service. However, as my cases in court have shown, there is a small remnant of judges, judicial officers, magistrates who work for the people, who are interested in observing the law, no matter what the powers that be say. You asked me about the international community. There are people who have condemned Pen International, Pen Germany, for providing for Kakwenza and myself the opportunity of exile. There are idiots in Uganda who do not realize that exile in the moment of torture is necessary retreat for us to leave the country and get treatment from our traumas. It is necessary for us to be rescued out of a country that has become dangerous where our lives are at stake. And so to be taken out of such a dangerous spot and be given 
uh, refuge, in places of sanctuary, is important because we cannot fight as writers when we are dead. I'm not going to write from my grave. And so the first thing that I'd like to tell the international community is to copy and emulate the example of Germany, of Penn Germany, an NGO, which working with the government of Germany has given us um, um, a, a, a amnesty for a year, for two years, for three years, there are very many Ugandans in the opposition who are rotting in neighboring Kenya, in Rwanda, in South Africa, in Zambia, waiting to be resettled to third countries because those foreign partners, especially in the first so-called first world, are not willing to avail and open more spaces. And the duplicity and hypocrisy has been seen because in the times of the Ukrainian crisis, we have seen them opening more doors for your Ukrainians. So while Ugandans are rotting away in asylum-seeking facilities and refugee camps that have become dangerous for them around Kenya, you know, Rwanda, South Africa, uh, I think that much more can be done by these third partner countries, Canada, UK, Europe, all of them, to take out people whose lives are clearly endangered, right? And so in terms of immediate small sorts of effects that can be done, Kakwenza's ability to leave Uganda on his broomstick, you know, the Rukira Bashaija power, that magical power, was facilitated because there are foreign partners who are willing to take the first small steps. It didn't take huge diplomatic negotiations. It didn't take too many euros. It took the willingness of foreign allies. And so the interventions can begin small but steadily, as well as the larger pressure pressure around conditionalities and conditionalities of funding, pressure such as the sanctions that Kakwenza mentioned for Kandiho and any others who are known to be um, uh, uh, implementers of torture. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I'm saying is there are possibilities and these can be pursued and that uh, Yoweri Museveni needs the foreign uh, partners because they're giving him aid. They are paying Amisom soldiers in Somalia. They are enabling his uh, military uh, conquests all over Central and East Africa and Eastern Africa as well. I think that therefore the foreign partners can play a big role. The pressure has to be both from within the country and without the country. So Kakwenza makes a very good point. And for those of us who are in exile, stop condemning us. I hear these Ugandans condemning us. Not condemn us because now I can say anything I want about Museveni and he will not be able to accuse me of offensive communication. I won't be arrested. And if I'm arrested, he needs to drag me home. But the laws, international laws protect me. So do not condemn those of us who are abroad because indeed for me, retreat is a time for re-strategizing, re-planning, re-equipping, and we're coming back to the battleground. We're coming back to do more in Uganda after we have healed. Thank you so much, Dr. Stella. Uh, Mr. Kakwenza, uh, as you hear Stella saying all of that, what comes to your mind? And, and specifically, how can we proceed uh, with keeping our politicians accountable, especially those people who engage in ordering uh, arrests and torture? Uh, in your case, Mr. Mohozi and other people that you, you know. Undress them. Yes, undress them. Uh, describe them, use literature, describe them, tell them they are obese. Yeah. Tell them that they are short-tempered, they are comajones, you know. You know, they are hiding in Section 25 of Computer Misuse Act, which was muggled in our laws just to protect them from uh, such criticism, you know. So for me, no one can come in my mouth to dictate on what to say. Huh? Uh, just like my mother, Stella Nyanzi, so... If Mr. Mohoz is very is, is obese, he has a big stomach, I must tell him. And I should not be judged by the world that uh, I am offending him, you know? So I really pity Mohoz if he thinks that he will win a war against writers. I really before, pity. yeah, before, before Stella Nyazi leaves, uh, because he's, he, he, I think she's going to be leaving very shortly. Uh, how have you guys been so far? Uh, where you are? How do you appreciate where you are? But also, are you thinking about writing a book together? 
what is it going to be about? Is it going to be about torture, sex, or parenting in exile? Or Why do you want to study or... our plans? But uh, Mr. Museven should wait for our missiles. <laughs> <laughs> How about Dr. Stella? What are your thoughts? <laughs> right. So for me, I think it's wonderful that Kakwenza is in Germany. It is wonderful that I saw him because every time I thought about his scars, I would start writing poetry and then I would break down and cry. And I had to touch those scars in order to heal myself of the trauma. Because when Kakwenza was, when we saw the torture on his back through pictures, I was also traumatized. Every writer in Uganda should know that what happened to Kakwenza can happen to them. And for me, I relieved the trauma. And so when he fled on the broomstick, I flew with him, but I didn't know where he was. As an older mother, I'm 47, Kakwenza is a young man. I grieve that Ugandans who are critical of Yoweri Museveni have to be bitten out of the country. We don't live willingly. There is a history of exile of writers from Byron Kawadwa to Okot Pabitek. There's a whole history that was produced, exilees, exodus, that started in the times of Idi Amin Dada. We have now come of age, as uh, Charles Onyango Obo has said, Uganda has come of age and produced more critical writers. It is very difficult for me to imagine a Uganda where many more will run because they've been scared. I hope that Kakwenza Rukira Vashaija will be the last. You asked about how we are going to productively use the time. I think the first thing is before people demand that we write and write and write, allow us to heal. Right. Okay? Allow right. us to first take care of our bodies, our minds. We are traumatized. Exile is not an easy place. We are living in winter right now. Okay, we have to adjust to new foods. We have to think about long distance parenting, in my case, parenting in a new language called Germany. Right. When we write, we shall write, I promise. Because I think for me, look at the wonderful library where my brother is. The opportunities here are amazing. The resources right. here are amazing. The protection within exile is amazing. The opportunities to travel and look for resources and material are amazing. I will write with Kakwenza. He will write with me. We shall co-edit books. We shall sit on panels together. We shall also write independently because that is important. I will criticize him. He will criticize him. We shall criticize the regime together. But I'm appealing that we be allowed to first heal. And some of our immediate tweets and Facebook posts and poems and chapters and and articles and essays are about releasing the pain of torture and trauma. And part of it is important for battle. Part of it is important for healing. We might also never write again. We might decide not to write again as a form of resistance. Okay. And so I think that the opportunities are immense. I think for me, what I want to do is to nurture other writers such that where Stella Nyanzi was uprooted, there'll be 20 other Stella Nyanzis. And I'm sure that we can do this together with Kakwenza. But like I said, allow us time to first heal from the trauma and the pain. And I know that healing is a process that is very productive for many writers. We write about the past. The wound, the pain, the insomnia, the anxiety, the memories, all of that we write out of our systems. But sometimes we get writer's block and we can't write these things out of our systems. So give us time. But the books are coming. I think what Kakwenza said is important. Undress the dictator. Undress the repressive, punitive tormentors who beat us, who killed our children, who tore our skins because those are stories. Every scar that is on Kakwenza's back, I have promised. Every scar for me is a story, is a poem. I will, I will, I will acknowledge and, and write and dedicate material to each of Kakwenza's scars. So they should not heal before I have clearly mapped and marked which piece will belong to them. Right. Do you, Do you know how many I'm there sorry, are? I have to go. Do I know how many there are? I have touched Kakwenza's back. 
My father was a medical doctor. His mother was a traditional healer. My father on my mother's side was a reverend, and we believe that our hands are blessed to heal. As a person whose body has been tortured and tormented many times, I know that it is important to touch a person who's been unloved and love them through the hands. The mm -hmm. loves are used for lovemaking, the, the hands are used for, for lovemaking, for healing, for medication, for ministering care and concern. And for me, when I touched Kakwenza's back, I touched my own soul. When I rubbed oil into Kakwenza's back, some people thought it was erotica. They thought it was sexual. Actually, for me, it was healing. And some of the reasons why this is important is because as a woman, I'm very touchy, right? And touching Kakwenza allowed my hands to write again. And so I thank you, blessed comrade. I thank you, little brother. I thank you, twin son of mine, because when I touched your hands, I was able to start writing again. And I, 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 I pay homage to your scars. They are, they are crowns. They are jewels. It's a pity your body was uh, marked on behalf of Ugandans, but that is the evidence we shall take to court one day. When we tell our stories, if they don't believe our evidence, your back is evidence. And so for me, it was holy. It was sacred. It was pure. It was a form of intercourse, not sexual, but, but mental intellectual to touch Kakwenza's hands as a form of blessing and anointing. And I thank you. I thank you, priest of mine. I thank you, twin son, because our spirituality sometimes demands we touch the hem of the garment of Kakwenza. So bye-bye, people. I have to go. Thank you so much. Have a nice Yes, trip enjoy the that. rest of the session. Uh, Kakwenza, I'll watch you afterwards. And Henry, thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye, people. Always a pleasure. See you on Tuesday. Sure, bye bye. Yeah, for sure. All right, all right. It's now you and I. Uh, James might join us shortly, uh, but let us go intimate now. How do you feel mentally? Uh, Dr. Stella mentioned a lot about mental, uh, the mental psych uh, that you folks are going through and the healing process that it's going to take for you. Uh, to get back to your feet, uh, not literally, but uh, uh, your mental stability to even write again. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, and I think uh, before you proceed with that, uh, Basingwa also had a question. Uh, before Lukilawasa, uh, uh, we are abducted in your opinion. We are those brutes able. To... Okay, so. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if that question is meant for you. I have um, seen the question and I will answer it. Yeah, okay. Proceed. But I, want to, I want to first answer you. You know, before I was uh, brutally arrested uh, this time on 28 December, I was already dealing with a very severe PTSD. Yeah. I had not healed from previous tortures and I was still dealing with it. I was still uh, seeing my psychiatrist. So when I was arrested again, it uh, became like it took a toll on me when I came out of prison. And right. enough, I changed the environment and I am slowly healing mentally. But uh, whenever I look at my scars still, you know, it, it, it really traumatizes me. Whenever I try to, uh, actually I'm very strong. Whenever I try to explain what happened to me in detail, right. I, times end up breaking down you know that is the reason we have seen my 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 nails have been uh decorated painted yet yeah, yeah this, red this is to, i have a lot of hema they call them hema, hema to something something in the, in the beds of my nails so i have to paint them just to yeah you know whenever i, I, lose, yeah. I, would, I would get traumatized so i had to paint my nails paint them. So that you can hide the torture, the visible torture yes. in your fingers. Yes. It's, yes. So, uh, but um, I'm healing. I'm in a very good place uh, by the lakeside, so it is giving me uh, a very good environment to, you know, think about myself, think about uh, other opportunities away from. I'm far away from the mudding crowd. Right. Mm. Yes. 
it's it's you know, what, what has, you know what was triggering my PTSD was you are walking you meet uh, a certain fool with with a, a convoy of sirens and what you get traumatized you know here those things are not there right you are walking and you feel uh, you, you meet a military or person um, an army person and you get traumatized you meet a police person you get traumatized you see a gun Ever since I reached here, I've not seen any convoy, I've not seen any police person, I've not seen any military person, I've not seen any gun, right. I've not seen any convoy, I've not had any sirens. So I um, I believe that in a month's time or two, I'll be completely fine. We shall give you that one month uh, or two. Uh, yes. Then to well, answer Kiza's question, um, right. I, think, I think I was... The, the, the brutes who arrested me, they used um, they used uh, a, a bold person. So yes, I did not have my Christmas in Kampala, but uh, when I arrived in Kampala at Games, is it Games Village Mall? Yeah, that's that that place in Bugolobi. No, in uh, in Inakawa, Lugogo side. So I I got a bold driver who uh, drove me up to my residence in Itsasi. So as I was getting arrested, I was, they were, as they were surrounding my house, I saw him with them. He was showing them that, or he was telling them that I saw him enter and close. So I don't know how uh, they came to know that he uh, brought me home or he drove me. I don't know how they used the app to, uh, you know, track my movements, but since then I always tell Ugandans to avoid Bolt and Uber. Right. Yes. Because that's how they got you. They, they got you and they broke into your house, actually. Uh, yeah. Because in, in previous uh, conversations that you have had, is uh, you, you said that you saw them from the top of your house uh, and you tried to uh, get away, but one of them saw you. Uh, and informed everyone else. Yes. Uh, how how did that process uh, transpire? You know, I I was inside and I had closed my door, and I was in the kitchen cooking. So when I had a lot uh, a lot of bangarang outside, I was like, now what is the problem? My you know my my house was always a very quiet it had a quiet environment. So I peeped through the curtain and I saw, you know, many army officers about 12 in uniform, about eight not in uniform. Then as I was trying to look for what next, my bedroom door was, I mean, a window was open and uh, it had no, the curtain was uh, astray. So he saw me. When he saw me, he alerted them that... <laughs> That I was inside. They were not. They was. They were not sure that I was inside. You know, so that is how they ask me to come out, and I refuse. And they use a sledgehammer to remove the bagra proof of the window and get in and beat me up and you know take me away. They beat you up and took you away without even informing your lawyer. Uh, how, how did you? Uh, Oh, when when I was when I realized that I was under house arrest, I I I got Let on you know. phone with my lawyer throughout until right. my until when my phone was was confiscated. Aaron did an uh, an amazing job following up and uh, looking up for uh, looking uh, for you and informing all your circles uh, about your uh, uh, arrest. How, how has Aaron been uh, doing mentally? Aaron is actually not doing fine mentally. He needs a he needs a holiday somewhere. <laughs> right, because it was a very traumatic event for him, uh, even as a lawyer himself. He's, he's not uh, actually right now. He's seeing a psychiatrist, psychologist. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think he needs uh, like two two weeks or one month away from that madness. He's not doing fine. He's sick. Yeah, he's yeah. sick. But okay. Was, it, was, it was too much. You know, even when he came to visit me in, in Chitaria and he looked at me, I saw, you know, I was the victim. I was the one is sick, but I saw that he was getting more sicker than me. Yeah. 
come to see. Yeah, I I, I know because I also tried to 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 connect with him, uh, and I I, I tried to I tried to uh, let him come and uh, engage, but I, I think his healing mechanism did not uh, allow him to, to to be the one speaking about your experiences. He wanted you to be the one speaking about those experiences, which yes. I appreciate. I, and when I came out. Uh, in total disregard of the orders of not talking about it, I spoke about it even when I was still in the country. You know, I, I thought know. I was I was born an iconoclast. I was born a critic, so no one can put sponge in my mouth to stop talking about the impunity. How did that, reason, that is a reason I will not even uh, get interested myself in political positions or working for a government. Because no one will tell me what to speak or not to speak, you know. Right. Yes. Do you uh, are you are you, do you are, are you privileged to talk about how you left the country, or is it something that is uh, you're not privy to talk about right now? You just know that I magically left Uganda and found <laughs> myself in Germany. <laughs> he magically left Uganda. All, all the credit goes to. Uh, Pen Germany, all the credit goes to Pen International. Yes, you have been uh, uh, awarded a fellowship with Pen uh, Writers uh, in Germany. Uh, how, how, how are you feeling about that? Of course, uh, I'm feeling good. I will not be idle. At least I will be having something that keep uh, something to keep me busy. Right. And I'm feeling good about it because, yeah, uh, it's, it's it's very good. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, your thoughts about uh, lawyer Mabidizi, who was who was also arrested. Uh, I know Mr. Mabidi, uh, lawyer Council Mabidizi, has been very consistent uh, with challenging the status quo and reporting almost each and everything that comes that he thinks is not. Uh, right. Well, what are your thoughts uh, about his arrest? And, uh, you know the problem you in Uganda? Yeah. Our problem is one, lawlessness. Actually, we do not deserve uh, Mabirizi. Mabirizi is a champion of rule of law. If yeah. the law says that we must follow such and such a procedure, and there are people who want to do otherwise, and Mabirizi comes up and challenges it, and uh, many people misconstrue it, misconstrue his actions as idleness. I don't really understand Ukrainians what they want. And right. you have seen Mabiris come after everyone. Yeah? Even if you are opposition, even if you are what, as yeah. long as you have not uh, followed the proper procedures the pass one to the law, of course he has to come uh, to, 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 you know, to, to correct that using the law, to ask, you know, the law says that this should be done, but it is not done. The law says that we should follow such a procedure, but it has not been followed. But you find people, you know... Uh, ridiculing him. Ridiculing him. It is very bad. We do not deserve Maviriz. Maviriz is a, a champion of rule of law. If he, went, if he went against uh, the Council of Fools in the judiciary, you know, uh, these people who are the Kada judges, the Kada magistrates, they are the ones who, who are supposed to be in prison, not Mavirizi. The, the only crime Mavirizi has done is to uh, call them to order. Hmm? Tell them that look, you're behaving like lumpens, you, as if you did not go to law school. You know? Yeah, well, what can we do to ensure that and, gets, an uh... attack, and an attack on one judicial officer who is going astray? One judicial officer who is very foolish and stupid doesn't mean that he has attacked the entire judiciary. Right. No. What, what do you advise we should do uh, as a society to ensure that uh, he gets out? Because I haven't seen a lot of uh, people pushing for him being released or set free. Uh, of course, some people have already uh, written him off. Some many people have construed his uh, actions, uh, his approach to to to, to the law. Uh, how can we educate Ugandans to stand with uh, a champion of law in Mavirizi? First of all, we need to first teach the Ugandans uh, the law. What the law says, what should be done, like Mavirizi has always done. If Ugandans knew 
about rule of law, they would really appreciate Mavirizi. If they really understood, they would be standing up for him right now. But because uh, you, many Ugandans do not know, that is why they are quiet. They are saying that, yeah, he has been arrested. He has been ridiculing the judicial officers, disrespecting them, uh, disrespecting uh, pastors. They don't know that he has been doing his duty as a citizen. Right. Civic and education is very important for us Ugandans. And that is something that has been kicked out of uh, the public arena, the public eye by, 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 by the system. Because they intentionally want to keep most Ugandans ignorant uh, of the law. Uh, in that when someone comes out and starts to use the exact law to educate them, to challenge the system, uh, they try to paint them as an outcast that should be uh, taken unseriously. Uh, do you think Ugandan elites are culprits in this process? The problem with Ugandans they are cowards, and they are very good at victimizing. Very good cowards, you know. They cannot, you know, if, if we all stood up and we began to unraise the Mohors, the CG, Museven, Will he arrest us? All of us, will he arrest us? Right. But the problem is they think, like, for example, me, myself, uh, using my literature to describe uh, my tormentors, they think that it is me who is wrong and Mohoz and Mzeven, they are right. They do not know that me, myself, my speech is protected by the law. I have freedom to express myself. It is court to decide whether I have offended someone or not. They do right. not have freedom. Me, I have freedom to express myself. They do not have the freedom to arrest me and detain me illegally and torture me. They do not have that freedom. Right. But whatever I went through, you find some Ugandans, you know, uh, blaming me that why did you do that? Why did you abuse the man? I did not abuse Mohoz. I did not abuse him seven. I simply described him. Some you, We should just appreciate uh, using literature to describe things. It's called descriptive literature. If you have a big stomach, if you have a small dick, and I write about you describing you, I have not offended you. I have exactly described how you are. If you are behaving like a lumpen, should I keep it? We should... Learn how to make use of English words. If someone is stupid, tell them that they are stupid. If someone is, you know, like, now, for example, I have talked about the magistrate who tried me. He should have stayed the proceedings, but he illegally allowed the prosecution or whatever persecution to go on. So if I come out and I call such a magistrate a lumpen, a bamburika or museven, it doesn't mean that I have offended him. I have clearly described what he is or how he behaves. He has a doctorate in laws, but he behaves like someone who did not even enter a law class. In right. total regard of human rights laws, he went ahead and began the prosecution against me. So if right. such a person, I come out and I tell him that, look, you behaved like a fool. Huh? You behaved like an, uh, an ignorant person. So it doesn't mean that I've offended him. I have told him the truth. He is a fool. When we come back, we are going to talk about how uh, the medical personnel approached you, your, your, the torture, how they reported ab about it, uh, and what your thoughts are about their uh, performance. We shall, we shall also uh, have uh, James Mugeni join us to talk about specifically how medical officers should behave uh, in, uh, in such cases. So, this is the state of the nation. Rifa Mugwanga. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Salva.
Right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. For uh, everyone who is joining us from wherever you are, uh, this is the state of the nation. My name is Henry Sully. Boba uh, Otugoweira ku YouTube. Subscribe. Uh, follow us uh, on Twitter and Facebook so that you can know what's going on. Uh, Mr. James Mugeni has joined right. us in this conversation, but uh, before we proceed, uh, I want to give Mr. Kakwenza an opportunity to speak in regards I have, to... I have only like 10 minutes with you. Yeah, that's fine. Mm. 10 minutes is fine. Uh, yes. So talk about uh, your, your experience uh, with the medical personnel, and then uh, we shall have a conversation with uh, James. Yeah, you see, when I, when I was sentenced or remanded to uh, Chitaria, uh, the officers there, they looked at me, they wondered what kind of a person who had sent me there. They had never seen someone as tortured as me. They all wondered why he had not sent me to uh, the hospital, instead sent me to prison. Little did they know that, little, little did they know that uh, the magistrate who presided over my, uh, I call it political persecution, was a bum leader of Museven and, and his son, Mohozi. I actually, the way I entered Chitaria is not the way I got out. At least I was a little bit healed. I credit the officers who really took a very good care of me. I was, I, I had access to the doctor. You saw the doctor's report? Yeah. Yes. So when I got out, when I got out of prison and went to access my uh, medical person, and he told me, he gave me the report. The report is out there. It is very embarrassing that after the magistrate had read it, he decided not to give me back my passport to go and seek medical attention outside. My doctor told me, please get means and quickly get out of the country and access medical attention in Europe. I got so shocked when I took the application to the magistrate to get my passport to enable me to travel, and he stupidly told me that I didn't need to travel abroad to get my application, that I could get it from here. Yet, the medical person who uh, uh, did all the tests and what is working for uh, the best hospital in Uganda. Right. Yeah. Right, so in wrapping up, so uh, as you wrap up, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll have to, to invite you back uh, again uh, to, to give, uh, hopefully when you are more healed than you are right now, uh, uh, in, in wrapping up this, uh, and uh, probably you can add some of the thoughts of Mr. Kiza here, Basingo. What are your thoughts? How should Ugandans behave, both Ugandans in the diaspora, but also Ugandans back home? How should we, we should, approach? We should not be cowards. We should, whenever we see an injustice, we should openly speak against it. We should not be cowards that we are going to be picked up. What, what, you know? Yeah, we should be active and be a responsible citizen. If Mr. Museven is a dictator, we should remind him all the time that he's a dictator without fear of litigation. You know, right. it doesn't make sense when you, you meet someone saying, Please keep quiet for once. You wait for your turn. Seven will die. And when? Huh? When? Right. We all speak up against the impunity that is surrounding us. Again, thank you so much for joining us. This is the State of the Nation. You are free here to speak any truth that you uh, you need to, to, uh, to report to the people of Uganda or to all Ugandans and the world. Wish you luck in everything that you, you, you are pursuing. Uh, and we'll, sh we'll see you again shortly. Have a great Sunday. Uh, Thank Michael. you so much for hosting me, Mr. Henry. You're most welcome. All right, Mr. Mgen, welcome. Uh, you yes. have had uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, both uh, Stella uh, and Mr. Kakwenza have said. Uh, your thoughts and as a legal, uh, sorry, as a medical uh, practitioner, uh, how are you responding to the thoughts you, you, you've just engaged with? Uh, I hope you can hear me very well because I'm, 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 I'm in a noisy place down in the hospital. Are you able to hear me? 
Yeah, we do hear you. Uh, James William again is my name. Uh, I have listened to both people. Not to judge them, but uh, when you listen to their language, <laughs> if you listen to their language, they are tortured. You can, you can see people who, who are still emotionally charged. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the truth is there's torture in Uganda. They would not be talking from where they are talking from. They should be talking from Uganda. And uh, it's a bit unfortunate. You know, Henry, I think last week or the other week when, when, when I was speaking to you, I told you the person who can stop torture in Uganda is the director of right. Lago Hospital. The director oh, of Lago Hospital. About that. Yes, 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 that's yes. what I told you, that the person who can, torture, who can stop torture in Uganda is the director of Lago Hospital. Now, it's interesting to see that he has been interdicted. Now, you don't know why he has been interdicted, but that tells you the whole history of torture, how torture is in Uganda. Now, once interdicted, like you have seen, that is a threat to the whole medical profession. And you're wondering why the medics might perhaps are quiet. Because you can't say that uh, perhaps uh, the, 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 the director of Mlago Hospital perhaps is guilty of this crime or whatever crimes they're accusing him for. But the silence of the whole medical fraternity, how did we reach that level? When you know that the medical system is organized, at every level there are checks and balances. So how did we reach a level where one is arrested and one is interdicted? You know, that's a whole slap on the medical profession, something that is embarrassingly big. But that said, I listened to you elaborating on torture. I mean, the laws that somebody is required to know. It's quite elaborate. And uh, like the two speakers mentioned, Somebody takes advantage of the ignorance and the silence of the, of the Ugandan population. It's not only the torture victims, it's the ignorance of the Ugandan population on the laws. And so it takes time, it takes a bit of education, it takes a bit of skilling for people to know that they have rights, that they have to defend this. But that said, I don't know whether you saw the police report today. I mean, it is running that they have they have been slapped with the cost of twelve billion shillings. Twelve billion shillings. Perhaps if the costs can be as high as that, maybe torture can be reduced. Because is the police is the Uganda police force comfortable with the twelve billion shillings that are supposed to to compensate the victims of torture? I don't think so. And then if those laps of the co of those costs are there, if the costs can be met, then perhaps then the police or those who torture victims will realize that there's a cost that is supposed to be paid when you torture people. So I'm wondering if, if compensation will be affected. That's another thing. So it's a difficult thing. It's a tricky thing. It requires a lot of input by all and especially the laws that govern torture. That's my take. Right. Yes. Thank you so much for that take, by the way. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Dr. Bialhanga and uh, the, the, the authorities that uh, uh, relieved him of his duties? No, my thought... I want you to, to speak to, 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 the, to the hierarchy uh, but also the process uh, through which he was relieved of his duties. To me, my take originally was that the medics stand out, which they never did. Now they are victims. Because there is no way if the medical system, the medical profession was running it is show, would we reach that level? Because it has a self-checking mechanism. And, and uh, you know, when, when and why was the state, the, the, the state house health monitoring team created? Why was it created? Was it as a result of medics being weak? 
or was it as a result of medics being making mistakes? No, these are areas that the medics themselves allowed this to happen, and now they are victims of their own. I, I call it moral neutrality. Medics should have stood out long time ago and defended the profession as medics, something that has been lacking. Because by the time the state house health monitoring team was created, and yet you have all the inspectorate in health, you have drug inspectors, you have National Drug Authority, you have, you mean, you have the Director General of Health Services with his team. What have they been doing other than succumbing to state house now? They played around with, with state house. They played around with, I, 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 if I can use part of the language that the Stella has used, that they played around with thugs. Now the thugger has entered the medical profession. It's right. very, very quick and difficult for them to come out of it. Because now that, it, I mean, how do, you, how do you even explain to the whole world that you have arrested uh, Dr. Biarugava? Where, how did he reach that level? Yet the disciplinary committee, the health monitoring, I mean, the director general of health, the whole team is there to have checked it. There was a mistake going on. So right now it's very difficult to know whether it is moral neutrality or the medics have just sacrificed him. I, actually, my take was that if the Arugaba has been arrested and there's no, there's no lash from the medics, then maybe they have arrested a criminal. That's what I said. Right. Because there's supposed to be a backlash from this. We're supposed to see it. So are the medics just saying, no, we are relieved of this criminal? I don't think so. So that's a very good question to ask. Uh, are they excited that uh, uh, one of their own uh, was relieved, uh, was relieved uh, without uh, any proper uh, process that would have uh, gone through the, those uh, investigations, at least they should have made uh, an official investigation. Investigations usually take time. Uh, but we don't know if he was forced to take a leave of absence or if he was actually relieved of his duties. Uh, many people have uh, been questioning uh, his wealth uh, and how he accumulated uh, the, the wealth that he has. Uh, but, but of course, uh, I am uh, someone who digs out information, uh, but I'm not really familiar with, uh, with uh, Mr. Bialugawa, and uh, I don't know how much he earns uh, as the, the head uh, of the, 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 the uh, as the head of, uh, of the medical uh, no. system in Uganda. The question is, Henry, when did this accumulation occur? At what level? And right. how long? He's, what, he's been working for seven years. What happens to the health monitoring system itself? Right. The director general of health service and his team. You are talking about the pharmacies. What about the National Drug Authority? These are all questions that. These are, are all uh, questions that are there. Yeah. How could one man have been an authority of all these people and people did nothing? Right. What were the accusations against him from the from fellow medics, apart from it coming from top? It's now coming from state house. Right. Were there any complaints that are known that we don't know? Because I, don't, I have not heard about them myself. Plus, why, why do we have to wait for the state house to take care of these uh, monitoring mechanisms when we do have so many other uh, sections of government that can take care of that. So, Henry, this is what I'm telling you that yes, the two speakers, the previous speakers have summarized it very well. Ugandans are cowards. And for how long shall we continue fearing? Because at the end of the day, the systems are collapsing into packs, into piles, one after the other. And like I told you some time back that the medics were the last men standing. Medicine stands out. Medicine is an arbitrator. Now, when you see torture victims complaining, crying out, and now who will speak for them? If the topmost medical person whom you'd expect to be speaking is now interdicted, he has lost all his authority. I don't think the next person who comes in, it's like, 
a bird, I mean, you shoot one bird on a, on a branch of a tree, the rest will fly away. That's what you are seeing. Because the medics themselves do not stand out against torture. This torture, we're just discussing it like stories, and we, we have not documented it anywhere. It is something that we ought to have documented, and like I said, we should discuss torture as an epidemic. So we are having a problem, a very, very huge problem. A very huge problem that I don't think can be corrected apart from, yes, uh, Kakwenza has said we cannot wish death. We cannot wish that death removes it, but people must remove this to show that people are active. Because if all are going to say that maybe wait for these guys to die, then perhaps we shall change. Then perhaps even if at their death, we will not have actively, proactively participated in making this change that we need to see. Do you suspect that uh, the State House personnel had your submission on the State of the Nation dialogue uh, and went swiftly to get rid of the, the one man you said uh, had the power to stop all this nonsense? Well, Henry, I, 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 can't, I can't deceive you. You are listened to by the whole world. You never know. This can't be an assumption, perhaps. I mean, you are listened to by the whole world. So sometimes you never know what happened. Let's take off, let's take him down. It's possible. It's very, yeah, very possible. If, 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 if Mr. Bialga uh, uh, had your, your submission and was uh, planning to, 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 to move, uh, to, to, to use his authority, uh, and as you said, if he's the big bird, one of the birds on a tree, uh, and they decide to shoot the big bird, all the other small birds are going to fly away. Uh, so shooting him down could have been a strategy uh, to silence anyone, uh, including whoever is coming in next, because whoever is coming in next uh, must ultimately answer uh, to the state house. Yes, yes. Yes, it sends, it sends signals. It's a strong signal. Who, who can now stand in his footsteps? And you know, even the appointment is clandestinely made because the medical service is a hierarchy. It has a hierarchy. By the time somebody becomes a director general, here and there, they have gone through hi hierarchies. The state house monitoring team is Cadre doctors, junior doctors, young doctors. You know, I, I don't know how I can, I can describe them. They don't pass through that. Uh, you know, uh, the language actually. I, I don't know how to put it, but there's that system that somebody has been bureaucracy blended, uh, blending. If the word is blending, you know, these are people who are just young doctors picked perhaps from, from the political schools, those who have uh, political thoughts, and then they are given responsibilities that destroy the seniority yeah. in the medicine that we have. Do you think there's an opportunity for the medical personnel or the, the medical professionals uh, to ally with the legal professionals to straighten up the broken system, especially as in regards to Tokyo as a pandemic or an endemic? Well, it, it all depends on how much, it all depends on how much the public demands. The public needs to ask for accountability. I mean, when you have a weak system, when people are not defended, by the way, the people you are seeing like the Kakwenzas, the Stellas, these people run away because the public is not defending them. You are, right. left, you are left alone. So at the end of the day, when you are alone, maybe the best you can do is to, 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 to relieve yourself or to take a flight. Yeah. Because if the public was rising up to say, we stand up, we stand against torture, this torture thing is left for a few victims of torture to talk about it themselves. At the end of the day, you are a lone voice against a state which you can't handle. Right. So it remains to be seen what the, the public response will be. 
It depends to be, I, I mean, talk about the legal system. You have just been talking about Mavirisi. Yeah. Where is he? He's locked. He's locked up. So, yeah. it, you know, it is either to, when, they, when they discover, when they isolate a voice, they go for it. It's, this is very unfortunate that uh, we're in this state. Uh, Kakwenza yes. just revealed to us that uh, even Aaron Kiza, uh, Kiza he, he is uh, potentially suffering from uh, some sort of uh, mental exhaustion as a result of uh, defending Kakwenza and seeing Kakwenza going through all the Tokyas uh, that he did uh, experience as a person. Uh, so mental I mean Henry you listen to the language of Stella you listen to the language of Henry that language is not normal they are trying to express themselves in, in the crudest way to raise anger they are fighting in that psychological that emotional torture I mean you just can't say that is normal it's not right. it's not and still, they cannot raise up the crowd. They cannot, people are not coming up to their defense. Right. And that hurts the whole country. Because finally, who will be there? Yeah. Every person is waiting for his turn. Right. Me and you, perhaps we are lucky. And they now, they are lucky because we are speaking from a distance. Right where it is safe for us to speak. I mean, I, I used to speak on radios in Uganda, in the studios, but by the time you finish, you find another DC waiting for you to explain right. what you've been saying. So it's only these states where we are, where perhaps we can raise voices, but still that now makes it even distant. It's more distant, it's more disconnected. Yes, Stella was appealing. Stop, people should stop saying that we are in, people are in exile. They're speaking from, yes, if they can't speak from home, why not speak where they are? Right, right. And yes. I think that's a, that, that was also a call to all other stakeholders in the diaspora to speak up, not to leave it to just a few of us uh, to point out these inconsistencies uh, in the rule of law in Uganda. Uh, but my friend, I know you are at work. Your final thoughts as we, uh, we close this conversation? Henry, torture is there in Uganda. And like you have just mentioned it, for example, we are about 80,000 Ugandans in the diaspora in USA. How did, this 80, how did we reach that number? Are we state envoys? I don't think so. If I asked you, were you brought in as a state envoy wherever you are? I don't think so. So these increasing numbers should be reasons for us to speak out. If the right. people at home cannot speak out, what about us who have an opportunity? This place creates opportunity for us to speak out. And I, I will always thank you for offering me this opportunity to talk about torture until we can achieve something on torture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Um, James Mugeni, for uh, offering all your expertise and for being, uh, being generous with your time and knowledge. Uh, in regard to Tokyo in Uganda. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you who is watching us. Uh, welcome you again to the African Alumni Association and specifically to the state of the nation. Thank you so much for following us. If you are on uh, YouTube, please subscribe, follow, uh, hit the bell so that you can know uh, any time we are going to host something. And uh, we are also on uh, Twitter, so please follow uh, Henry Sully. Follow us at Henry Sully to uh, learn more about what we are talking about. This week, we do have a Women's Day uh, conversations, uh, conversation coming up on Tuesday uh, from 3 p.m. Uh, Toronto time. That will be around 11 p.m. Kampala and about, uh, I believe, 8 p.m. Uh, in uh, Europe. So follow us on uh, all the, the, the media platforms, Henry Sully, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to hear about the conversation on Tuesday. 
it's, it's going to be very important. Stella Nyans will be joining us as well and a few other scholars uh, in the diaspora. So please join us uh, as we celebrate International Women's Day. Again, thank you so much for following us. Uh, my name is Henry Sully and this is The State. This is The State of the Nation. Rifa Mwanga. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The State of the Nation with Henry Sully.